Amps in the Zone, Steve Vai's Jose Modded Marshall Super League. I want this video to be about this amp and how it sounds and also be kind of a definitive reference into exactly what Jose did to these amplifiers back in the day. So there's gonna be lots of audio demos and tones and playing. It's gonna be an interview with Steve Vai about what he used the amp for and how he got it and all that good stuff, awesome. There's gonna be an interview with Dave Friedman who's an authority on these amps and the mods, awesome. But first off, let's hear what it sounds like. So in the 1970s through the early 1980s, there was really very few amps, relatively speaking, on the market, especially compared to today. I mean, your options were basically Fender, Vox, Marshall, you know, all the big ones. Of course, there was Orange, Sound City, Hi Watt, a few others out there, Acoustic. And at this time, there was an explosion of music going on. I mean, the studios were in full swing. Yeah, just in LA, when I think about it, I mean, guitar players like Larry Carlton, Steve Lukather, Jay Graydon, all in the studios, all making killer records. And of course, at that time, LA was also a hotbed for rock and roll bands. I mean, you think about the mid to late 70s, clubs like the Starwood and the Whiskey, Gazzari's, so lots of music going on, and guitar players wanted more. More control, more tone, more sustain, more options, control over volume, more than what the amplifiers on the market could give them. So this is how some amplifier repair guys became amp modders. I mean, let's take Randall Smith, for example, who started Mesa Boogie. The birth of Mesa Boogie was basically Randall uh, turning little Fender combo amps into hot rod little monsters doing way more than they were designed to do. You had Paul Rivera, too, uh, who owns Rivera Amplifiers, uh, modding Marshalls and Fenders for the LA Studio Elite guys, you know, once again, adding gain, master volumes, and then later on, actually, in the early 80s, joining Fender and creating some really cool amplifiers like the uh, Super Champ and the Concert. And then you had a guy named Jose Arredondo, whose notoriety grew, ironically, not when he worked for a big company, because he did do that. My research tells me he worked for Ampeg and Vox, but his notoriety grew later on when he owned a little repair shop on Van Nuys Boulevard in LA's San Fernando Valley. Jose's shop was called Arco Electronics, and he had one very special customer that blew the doors wide open for him. I'm, of course, talking about Eddie Van Halen. He said that it was Jose that had taken his main amplifier that he recorded all that great early Van Halen music with and modified it. Now, it turns out that Ed was allegedly just trying to throw Jose some business, that the amp was basically stock and Jose just had sort of performed routine maintenance on it and Ed's other amps over the years. But one thing Jose did indeed do is come up with modifications for Marshall amplifiers. As I said, guitar players were always looking for more, more sustain, more gain, more saturation, more control over volume, adding gain and sustain and saturation to the already sort of formidable core Marshall crunch tone, as well as master volume modifications in order to get that crunch and that sustain and that aggressive tone, but at more reasonable volume levels without making eardrums bleed. Well, at least bleed as much. So Eddie was for sure the catalyst. Pretty soon Jose was modding amplifiers like crazy. I specifically remember calling him from Canada when I was a kid. There was an amp for $300 in a local music store. It was a 1973 Marshall Four Hole Super Lead, much like this amplifier right here. And I was gonna buy it and send it to Jose. And I actually called him on the phone sometime in 1986 or 87 and, uh, and talked to him about the possibility of sending this amp. It never happened, but I knew about him all the way up there in Canada and I was just a kid. So one of the other people that definitely knew about Jose back then and probably knows more about his mods now than just about anybody out there is David Friedman of Friedman Amplifiers. <laughs> It 
it's the infamous Mr. David Friedman. Hello. And I'm going to guess uh, that probably nobody alive knows more about Jose Amps than you. Uh, Maybe. And so this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. There might be someone else. I mean, first of all, we're here with this kind of iconic amp of, of Steve Vai's. You looked at the date on it, and it's something like a 75, right? Yeah, it's around a 75, yeah. yeah. So, so, so like uh, early, uh, mid-70s circuit board amp, actually. Um, okay. Still before they went to square switches and stuff, so. Right, and a standard four-hole super lead circuit, that's the way it would have started life? It started life as a four-hole super lead circuit, yeah. It's kind of got a good uh, amount of uh, play voltage like that era amp did. A little under 500. Okay. So it's healthy. And Steve is just kind of having you go through it and do filter caps and standard maintenance? Uh, yeah, so it was basically a restoration. Tubes, filter caps, uh, it had been Mickey Mouse a little bit over, over the years. It was in dire need of refurbishment, shall we say. One of the interesting things about these amps is people think Jose, Jose mods, but they're not all the same, are they? I mean, there was a number of things that he did. There's right? a number, a number of different mods. Four or five different variations. Of things that he would of do. Of the mods over the years. I kind of think it was like experimentation over the years on some of them. Okay. You yeah. know, before he kind of honed it in. I had an amp done by him in 1988. When I first moved to California, I took an amp to him. It was called the 3-in-1 mod. So that was the most basic one. Uh, essentially, what 3-in-1 meant was you had three inputs that you could use. So what was your amp? It was a, a, a four-hole? It was a four-hole. It was a plexi, actually. Oh, was it? So it's yeah. the late 60s? Okay. Uh, it, yeah. If I really think about it now, <laughs> yeah. it was a, a black flag era 100 watt wow. uh, plexi. So it had the big output transformer and stuff in it. And was it pretty unmolested at that point? Or? Yeah. But it, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't worth the money they're worth now then. Thousand dollar ant, maybe. You know? Right, not, right. Not like, not crazy, and, you know. Of course, why not mod it? <laughs> uh, that amp later actually got sold to Lon Cohen Studio Rentals, and he had it for years. And recently, I do believe he unloaded that amp, something like 25K or something. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Or 20K or something like that. Wow, wow. Because I asked him, like, can I buy this back from you? And he's <laughs> like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you got what was called the 3-in-1 mod in there. 3-in-1. So uh, kind of most of his mods were 3-in-1 three-in-ones, but with different variations, sort of. What three-in-one meant is you have essentially three inputs, right? So um, this one generally is the higher gain input that you have right here. Normally it would be the low gain input uh, on a Plexi, right? It would be, but this the little dots around it are from Jose, and that's like how he, you know, are telling you, you know, that that's the high gain input. Okay. And in order to get that high gain input to, to work, you have to have this gain pot pulled. Okay. So uh, if it's not pulled, no sound. Sound. <laughs> um, so uh, essentially what it is, is that's an extra gain stage that he added in the amplifier. Okay. Uh, and then uh, on the out of that gain stage is a pot. Uh, so you can vary the amount of gain. So if you want to turn it down. So you can, you can you know, vary the amount of gain you have on that added stage. So that's actually a tube in front of the whole thing, right? That's that a tube in tube. front of the whole thing. The concept, the basic concept of the mod was add a tube stage in front of a stock super lead amp that has an added master volume. So that was the basic mod. Okay. It's a half of a tube in front of a stock super lead with a regular old run-of-the-mill master volume, like a JCM 800 master volume. A step up from that was he parallel of the tube he added. He paralleled two gain stages together, which gets a little more uh, a little more push, a little more voltage out of that stage to push the amp a little harder. When I said it's really like a gain stage in front of a stock super lead, well, they even did it where you have a pull both knob for the bass channel. So it's sort of like jumpering an old super lead. And you can blend it in. Okay. Now, will it cut 
the gain ever so slightly when you pull it, it out? It does cut the gain ever so slightly, just like jump ring on a, right. on, on a regular amp. So for those that don't know jump ring on an old Marshall, I mean, the basic input that most people plug into is going to be this top left input that gives you the volume one control only. And that's the kind of the treble channel amplifier, the most usable channel on its own. Uh, what some people used to do is plug into the bottom, and still do to this day, plug into the bottom input for channel one, jumper it over to the top input of channel two, and now you can turn up volume two here, the normal or kind of bassier channel, which sounds, in my opinion, probably in most people's opinion, relatively useless on its own. Uh, but when you jumper, you can blend in that darker, bassier tone and get kind of a fuller sound, can be useful. One thing that happens when you do this, though, is you lose just a little bit of gain. So it makes the amp a little less punchy, a little less gainy. And on the Jose mod, Steve's amp, pull that pot out. It's going to do the exact same thing. Just internally, it's going to jumper these two controls. You're going to be able to blend the uh, the bass channel with this one, the main kind of rock and roll treble channel. But you will get just a little bit less gain when you jumper. I don't know if that many people use that function of it, but it would be useful if you, you know, you were trying to use this with a telly or a strat or something, or you wanted a little more richer kind of tone to it. Now, if you don't use this input, yeah, and you turn this off, you can plug into these other inputs. Okay. So then you have. So. So all that is is stock super lead with the clipping diodes in. Then there's another variation of the mod um, where he um, did a push pull master, and on the master is what what most people know about these amps were clipping diodes. So let's talk about the clipping diodes for a minute and what that does to the tone. That is that's diode or or solid state clipping essentially, right? Yes, it's, it's operating like a typical clipping diode. It's almost operating like a limiter. In this circuit, it's after all the tube stages, right before the EQ. It uses Zener diodes. It's not exactly uh, what you typically think in pedal clipping or, or Marshall Jubilees or anything like that, but hmm. um, it's a cool sound. It's not really, it, the funny thing is, it's not really that much different than cranking the amp up in the tonality. It just allows you to do it kind of at a lower volume. So, and you mentioned this to me before, is that a lot of what Jose was doing was try to get that crank sound, but at a lower volume. I mean, that yeah. seems to be a lot of what he was trying to achieve, right? Exactly. And the, and the thing, that's what it was. That, Sounded that's what it was. When he told me, it was, you know, it was all about trying to get that tone without, you know, turning a plexi or, or, or four input amp on 10. You know what I mean? I mean, this was way before the scads of gain that people use today that probably shouldn't. You know, but this is about as high gain as it got um, in this particular amp. But there were two styles of masters. So one was pre-EQ and one was post-EQ. Okay. So this amp has both. The, the, so essentially this amp's pretty loaded. Uh, it's got the parallel gain stages up front and it has the clipping diodes in it. So it's high, so high gain. So it's as high gain as I've seen from from him. Now the interesting thing is I remember I remember him telling me about the master volumes when I had my amp done. We didn't put it in, we just got the basic thing done. But he did tell me that the which, which I come to know now is the pre tone stack master volume was more designed for lower volume playing. Okay. Um and the vast majority of Jose's don't even have that master volume in it that I've seen. Hmm. And I've seen a bunch. Um, but there's, it's designed for lower volume playing. Now, later, when you show this in this video, you'll understand what that meant. With the pre-tone stack master, there's kind of a fuller sound to the overall tone. Almost like you had a resonance knob on the amp or something. Like the loudness button on it, an old stereo. It's, it's kind of like a loudness <laughs> button on the old stereo, yeah. It gives you a girthier kind of low end, and at lower volume playing, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now, you can use it at higher volume and just EQ the amp differently. But most people that are doing these mods, like for like today, use this pre-tone stack master. And, you know, frankly, I like both. I, I, th I mm. think they both have their merits. It's not exactly the best uh, switching method in the world. It, it pops quite a bit. 
<laughs> as you can see. So this is a cool little piece of knowledge that Dave shared with us because now you've got some knowledge that you're armed with. If you're taking an amp in to get modded with a Jose style master, uh, you know whether or not you want the pre-EQ master, the post-EQ master, or both. Um, he's informed me that you can't actually get this style of pot anymore, the push-pull pot, they just aren't made anymore, but you could put it on like a toggle switch or something like that. Less low end, right? Almost loudness. Yeah, like and we're at a pretty low volume right now, so yeah. that's really interesting. I think even through the camera mic, that's totally audible and, and makes sense. The thinner sounding master volume, if you crank it up, or again, just EQ it a little different. Yeah. Most of the amps um, that I've been in over the years, and, and this number's a lot so so my Japanese distributor has a collection of like seven of them and I've been in all seven of them and I've seen different variations none of his have the clipping diodes many of the other ones over the years were the basic ones like I had that I saw I've only seen three or four with the clipping diodes and no they weren't ones that had the clipping diodes taken out they were just never in there Okay. So, um, so he, would he do the push pull master without the clipping diodes, or is that a part of? It? Generally speaking, if it had the push pull master, it had the clipping diodes. The the, the clipping diodes is um, ever so slightly more sort of metal sounding, where the non is a little more classic sounding. You know, he liked the high voltage amps. They sounded better. I remember him telling me that. Mm. He hated like the JC made hundreds and stuff mm. when they came out because the voltage was too low in him. He didn't like them for his mods really. Uh, he had he had a little transformer that he used to put in some of the amps that I saw that actually boosted boosted the high voltage. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, it's something he was experimenting with because he didn't like the newer the newer lower voltage things that didn't sound right to him. Uh, okay. Just little tidbits I remember, <clears throat> vaguely remember, you know, when he was, when I was talking to him and stuff. So with the mods on this particular amp, like when I think about Plexi EQ, many times you just crank the snot out of it. Does that change like on this amp as far as like where you're going to set the treble, presence, bass, mids? Uh, is yeah. it like, you know? Um, anytime you add a gain stage that's in front, um, you're pushing more signal level through the EQ. And the more signal level you push through the EQ, the more active the EQ becomes. That's why Plexi kind of EQ is kind of, you know, right. not, not fully useful, you know. It's not like the modern amp where, you know, you, oh yeah, listen to that mid and listen to the... They're pretty slim in the bass, these amps. Mm. So my, my thought is you're going to have the bass up. More than you might on 10 it. maybe. Really? Okay. Yeah. Because the first two gain stages are have no bass. That's interesting. So did he do that? Yeah. So that's part of his thing. Well, it's, it's just uh, the, typical, uh, um, the typical bright channel on a Marshall, which doesn't have a lot of bass. Hmm. And then the, the tube stage that he added also had a 0022 cap on the output of it, so no bass. And that's by design? Even more cutting, yeah. Maybe by design. Right. Uh, yeah, I think so. Just to tighten it up and make it make it super tight. Now you can. I've, there's been a couple variations of the mod where I've seen a bigger cap on out of the first stage, but again, dependent amp to amp. I mean, they were really tailored to the the artists that got these amps. You know, so interesting. So if you had a player that was maybe a little bit more of a classic, less metal, a little more classic rock, you might leave a little more low end in that first yeah, stage. Yeah, I mean, there's experimenting. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is like the Model T, you know, of, of amp mods, so to speak. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's the beginning of, of it all, you know, sort of. Basically, in Los Angeles, you had two amp modders. You had Lee Jackson. You had uh, Jose Arredondo. Yeah, they were the two guys, right? I mean... Absolutely. Yeah. Do you remember anybody else at that time that was that was doing this kind of stuff? They were the two main guys. I mean, there. I mean, there. yes, there was a few other people. Yeah. Lee actually worked for Rivera. Oh. So... That's interesting. Lee got, I think, a lot of his stuff from Paul Rivera. 
Jose was kind of doing his own thing, though. This was kind of like... I mean, the concept is simple. Take a super lead, put a master on it, and put a gain stage in front of it to boost it. Like you were boosting it with a pedal or something. But the beauty of this is high voltage, a real tube stage, all yeah. that organic yeah. kind of chewiness you're not going to get out of probably most pedals, right? Yeah. No. Tough. No. Not exactly, yeah. 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 It's cool. It's a very uh, harmonically rich amp. So Steve contacted you, or you were having a conversation. This amp came up, right? And then he, he said, yeah, I wouldn't mind sending that to Yeah, you. I think it was on that when we had him on Tone Talk, I'm pretty sure. And he brought it up. He'd go, oh, hey, you know, I wouldn't mind getting these two, his two, Jose's, okay. that, that he used. Um, from my understanding, that I mean, that's what was used on, for sure, on tour uh, for Eat em and Smile. So Steve informed me that the heads he got in the mid-80s and then he actually used all the way through the Dave Lee Roth days, through White Snake and uh, into the early 90s. So more on that in a little bit. Now in this photograph, this is a, a blurry photo that you can see the, uh, the Steve's amp rack there on the left. Uh, and I believe the two uh, Jose heads are the two top ones in the rack. And then the bottom two are his Lee Jackson heads. Now... Uh, the funny thing about this picture is that that looks like four Marshall heads in a rack, but actually those are false Marshall faceplates and all the heads were pulled out of their original head shells and just kind of mounted uh, in this rack on shelves and uh, with, with the false faceplates. So the head that's in my studio now, Dave Friedman's got a new head shell for it and he's mounted it in a new repro head shell. He'll do that with the other Jose head that he has that he's working on for Steve. So when Steve gets him back, there'll be a nice brand new head shells. It must be fun to get into these and see what was done and stuff. Like every single one, oh, it's a little like uh, time travel, right? It's totally time travel, and that, that it's fun. And I've been in a lot of them now, so you know it's. Yeah, God, I, kind of, I shudder to think how many six, sixteen to twenty of them over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks for all the info. I mean, this is going to be really interesting for folks that are uh, history buffs. Absolutely. <laughs> second piece of music in the uh, video i used my old black back loaded g12m black back loaded uh 1970s late 1970s marshall cab and i'm miking with my standard mics these days an sm57 and an st170 ribbon mic and the mics are running into my um bae dual 1073 mp microphone preamp so just like old neat 1073 style mic pre's <laughs> first rhythm part I use the tone that is sort of fast becoming my favorite sound on this amp which is the pre-master EQ 
and I'm running into, the, of course, the high gain input. I got the gain back down. There's a marking on the amp. You can see maybe there, if you look really close, it's like at two o'clock that people have marked with a grease, somebody's marked it with a grease pencil there. And uh, that sounds cool. I've probably got just a little bit more gain than that, because this is the knob that controls the gain coming out of that first tube. <laughs> If I turn that all the way up, it gets super gainy and saturated. Actually, I can't even sit that close to the amp. But you can hear it's a little bit sloppy, so if you back it down a little ways, where it's somewhere around where that marking is or a little bit above. harmonically rich saturation it sounds really cool not using the bass channel so that's pushed in the pull both is pushed in at the channel one volume on 10 treble is on about eight the mids are on five bass is on six and the presence is on 10 which is where Steve had it marked so treble on 10 presence on 10 Tre trebles on eight really but you can turn it down it just gets a little more control <laughs> And then, I don't know, it just sounds great with the master pre-EQ, it's got that chewy thing. This is what I think of that sound with the Zener diodes, that chewy kind of articulation. That's really why I wrote that little riff, because it just sounded right with this, with this tone. And it's kind of aggressive and sort of metal sounding, it sounds cool, like old school metal sounding. <laughs> Uh, and the bass being on six. The middle there seemed like a cool middle ground. The presence, you can back it down, but it sounds cool up there with all that hair on the tone. just adds the articulation and stuff. I don't know, I just think it sounds cool like that. So that's the tone that I used for the rhythm part in the left channel on the song. So I just cut the rhythm part in the right channel, and um, I dialed in the sound using the post master. And it just feels a little more open, actually, but in a way that just kind of a little more wild. And I think, I, as I was saying, I think I like the master in the other position better. It strikes me as a little midier. Um, and I've got the mids back down to about where they were marked now by, uh, I assume by Steve on the amp. Um, listen how fast the mids come on if I turn them up. And it just gets a little wild and out of control sounding to me. Um, so it sounds better with the mids down quite a bit below half, maybe around, you know, 10 o'clock or so. Trebles on eight once again, the presence is cranked, and the bass is now on about six. Sounds really cool. Still think I like that other sound a little bit better, but still got that crazy harmonically rich thing. I just love all those harmonics when you play those chords on the second, third, and fourth strings. Okay, so I just cut the uh, the big splangy chords that go under the halftime solo on the left side. So for this, I'm using um, the top input, which means I don't have the extra tube in line. So much more of a plexi thing going on, but still with the master pre-EQ. So I got the Zeners at all times. 
can't get rid of those. And I'm, it, you'll notice that the EQ works much more like a plexi. Um, it's actually still pretty aggressive, you know, now that I'm just... And that must have something to do with that master. Um, but it's, you know, when you turn the knobs on a four home Marshall without any mods, it doesn't change that. I think I had the mids right around five or six. Now I got the gain down around six right now. Um, and, you know, these amps still just clean up beautifully even with these mods and all that. And that's the difference between like seven and 10 on the volume on the guitar. Okay, so I think what I'm gonna do now is switch the master to the, the post master, and I'm also gonna switch in the, uh, the, the bass channel uh, using this pull knob and maybe play a single coil guitar to play the rhythm guitar part on the other side for the splangy chords. I'll mix in some of that channel that's got all that, you know, that low end in it, but with single coils it won't be so, so fat and sloppy, so I'm gonna do that now. Okay, so with single coils, blending in that normal channel, so you can hear how much the gain gets cut when I when I take out the normal channel when I get rid of that blend pot. It's quite a bit of gain, but that cleans it up really nice. It's got a great tone, you know? It sounds really great with the uh, this guitar in the position too. Okay, the other thing I did is I'm using the master post EQ right now. Um, so it's got that little bit more wide open feel and that works great for this tone. Sounds really cool to me. I dig it. As far as other control settings, I've got the volume up because it was cutting the gain quite a bit to engage that other channel. So I've got the volume one up now around eight and volume two, the bass channel is mixed in at about four. Okay, and I got the treble on eight, the mids down quite low. Once again, I like the mids lower with the the post EQ master, so they're on about 10.30. Bass is on about six, and the treble, uh, presence is on about six.
legendary Steve Vai, of course, owner of this amplifier, was nice enough to spend some time on uh, video chat with me, and he let me ask him some questions about this amplifier, how he came by it, what he used it for. Uh, let's check that out now. Hi, Steve. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to answer a few questions. This is a real honor for me. Uh, thank you, Pete. It's nice to be here with you, brother. I'll just start off by asking about the, this this amplifier that I've got here, which was in for um, just kind of routine service, I think, with my good friend Dave Friedman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he mentioned that you've had it since, I think, the 80s. And I was wondering if you could just tell me the story of it, kind of where it came from. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, you know, when I was... Uh, when I was young, going to uh, Berkeley, and and when I was in high school, and uh, you know, learning the guitar and playing in little bands and making my way around, uh, I, I paid very little attention to amplifiers because I never had the money to buy a, a respectable amp, so to speak. Uh, the idea of owning a Marshall or any kind of a stack was was like a far off fantasy. So. Um, I never really applied much attention to amplifiers. They they were always just something that allowed a guitar to be heard, you know, okay. as opposed to really listening to the different qualities. I started to first recognize quality amp changes when I got my uh, my first real amp that I loved when I was in high school. It was a Bandmaster, Fender Bandmaster. You know, sure. Head and two... Uh, four, I think I had two big 12 inch speed. Well, four. It was four by 12 cap. It was just like heaven. Ah. Uh, and then I, I started, other amps started coming across my uh, radar. And that's when I really started to hear the difference between solid state and tube amps. Okay. You know? So as time went on, and I still couldn't afford real substantial amps, when I moved to California and in 1980 and started working with Zappa, he. Uh, he had everything. Mm. So this is when I first really had an opportunity to play through a Marshall um, uh, an acoustic amp. I don't know if you remember those. They were way. Sure. Uh, they were fantastic. And uh, Frank was working with Carvin at the time also. So that's how I I had knew about Carvin when I was a young teenager because they used to send out this brochure mm. and the. Sure, had like photos on a front lawn of, of these stacks and stacks of, of amplifiers. And it was like kind of like porn, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I, I used to get these uh, uh, these little catalogs and just oogle over them. So when I moved out to California and I started playing with some of Frank's Marshalls, uh, they were almost like intimidating or something. There was something mm. about the sound that just. I couldn't wrap my fingers around, you know. Um, uh, I guess they were too honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I needed something with a little more schmutz to, you know, to be comfortable with. I, I just, you know, that was in my mind at the time. So yeah. then, um, uh, as uh, as uh, things would would have it, I eventually left Frank, and I was with a band called Alcatraz, where I was fooling around with some different amps. But it was when I joined Dave Roth that. <laughs> I came to rehearsal with my Carvins and stuff, and they just weren't cutting it because I had kind of re created a relationship with Carvin when I was with Frank, mm -hmm. and I was using their stack. It was called an X100B amp. Sure. Yeah. And, um, that and to me that was like amazing because it was a real stack. It had two cabinets mm -hmm. and the big head, and I'm like, I just look at it. Oh my God, is that really mine? You know. <laughs> And uh, I, I never could really get um, it's it, it, it was great to have it. There was a sound in it that still wasn't quite there for my ear. Mm -hmm. You know, I was still kind of searching. So uh, when I brought that stuff into Dave Roth band, I actually used that carbon on some of the recordings for Eat Him and Smile, the song uh, Going Crazy which was actually a, a rough guitar guide track that we ended up keeping. But there was, I, I needed something more. And luckily for me, recording in the same studio, uh, the next studio over, was Steve Stevens. Yeah. And at Good the time, yeah. yeah, he's fantastic, you know. And, and Steve always had an incredible tone. And he had, um, he just had it so together, you know. And I'd listen to his sound. And I'd go, God, it sounds so good, you know. And he said, well, here, take this amp and take these. And he gave me these these marshals and these, you know, uh, cabinets. 
And I started to use them on Eat'em and Smile. And they were fantastic, they, you know, um, but they weren't mine. And I, you know, I started thinking, well, let me, let me get into this whole kind of martial uh, thing. At the time, there wasn't a, a, a tremendous amount of boutique amps, you know. I mean, sure. as I was progressing uh, from the early, early 80s, then things like Egnator and Bogner and Saldano, you know, these things came along, but it was really Marshall was the workhorse. So um, I started to try to find some good Marshalls because Roth wanted me to uh, <clears throat> have the right, you know, the right amps. Something about Steve Stevens amps was very, um, I, I liked it, you know, it was comfortable mm -hmm. to my ear, but uh, when I would try to find another Marshall that it just, they, they weren't doing it for me. But um, lucky for me, because I was working with Dave Roth, I inherited <laughs> a whole crew of people that had worked with Edward and had, uh, you know, uh, just a lot more of mature experience in these kinds of things, you know, uh, uh, finding amplifiers and fooling around with them. After I had left Roth, I was actually invited by Edward up to his house once and his ah. studio. <laughs> and it was it was fantastic. It was I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> and <Yeah>. he's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. See that amp right over there? And I'm looking at this beat up Marshall head. And he said, I've recorded every single Van Halen song on that amp, with the exception of two songs. And I think mm -hmm. one of them was uh, Finish What You Started. Or that was like oh. direct or something like that. I can't remember. Right. The other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that was that was a, a little piece of history I was able to witness, but I had decided then to try to uh, to have uh, um, Jose mod some marshals. So I found some of the you know uh, actually he may have found them for me even because there was certain mm. things he was looking for. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe my tech. I'm, uh, but but I had gotten these three or four marshals, and. Um, gave them to him now the only problem was uh he took a really long time it take it would take him like a year for an amp you know okay. and i was fortunate because of the situation i was in that he jumped on my needs pretty quickly but still it took a long time but i ended up with these four kind of precious marshals that i really like the sound of them um and i used them all throughout the dave roth stuff and uh that's the one of them is the one Right in back you. I mean, I know you mentioned that Marshalls were a little bit like uncomfortable almost playing. And I get that from the first time I played a, a loud plexi because it was just like yeah. a wild horse and, uh, and so much volume, but without a friendly quality necessarily. Uh, so, so did you feel like maybe it's like, oh, Jose's turning these things into something that's a little bit more friendly and usable? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought, because I felt the same way. The Marshalls were like uh, monoliths or something, you know, and oh, especially okay. a plexi. I mean, in order to get a tone out of that, that was appropriate for what I was doing. You, you just had to be balls out on it. You yeah. Know? You had to cram it. And that's painful, man. Yeah. It's painful. I, I just didn't like it um, because stage volume. Well, <laughs> with Dave Roth, the stage volume of the guitar was the loudest thing in the history of man. <laughs> Pretty sure it was because wow. Dave, Dave could not get enough guitar. He mm. had to have more and more. So I had, <laughs> it, the stage was set up with these like platforms, you know, it was kind of like this and you can go up on each platform, but underneath all the platforms was speaker cabinets my speaker cabinets <laughs> and if you look if you were standing on stage and you look to the left the entire side fills along the bottom from the back of the stage to the front were speaker cabinets yeah both sides and then in the floor which you couldn't see there was these grates and underneath the grates were my speaker cabinets <laughs> and uh, and and dave just it was never loud enough and uh so wow. i had basically one amp pushing everything but racks of power amps racks and racks of power amps and effects all going out to the various uh, uh cabinets when i 
when I would play a note, man, if you if you weren't protected, you'd never have children again. That's <laughs> So then what happened was when I started to record Passion and Warfare, I just kept blowing them up, you know. Mm, okay. And at some point, I, they were put aside and other amplifiers started to come on my radar. The Egnator, the Wagner, Saldano, you know, these kinds of amps. I, I, I used them for a season, you know, and really liked them. And uh, for me, there was just that. I mean, they were fine, but there was just something missing, okay, you know, yeah. just sure. to my ear. Later on... Uh, I had gone back to working with Carvin. Yeah. They were uh, interested in making a custom amp, you know, because, you know, like I had mentioned, the X100B wasn't doing it either. So I actually spent a lot of time, maybe a year and a half, not, I mean, not intensely, kind of studying amplifier construction and what it was, because I never knew anything about how an amplifier worked. It was all just like a, like a magic trick or something to me, you know? Mm. Right. And, uh, yeah, so then I, we worked really hard and we went through a lot of prototypes and finally came up with the Legacy, which was the amp that for me was, there we go. There sure. We, yeah. And with a good long run with that one and highly successful. I mean, they, they made yeah. them for a lot of years, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah, many. Yeah. And and the, the I think I had four Marshall heads that were modded. Three of them were done by Jose. One of them by, I think it was Lee Jackson. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one, that one, is gone. I so I sold it with a big, uh, you know, like rig from that period. For, okay. I sold it for charity. Uh, I think you have two of them there, right? There's two in yeah that Dave is working on. Uh, yeah. This this one is a 75, um, and Dave said it was maybe I'm not sure, but he said this was the preferred one. I think that he yeah. uh, I don't know if that was his preference or yours, but yeah. but that's what he mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the third was stolen um when back in the 80s i was rehearsing with david perkins palace and one night uh, somehow five of my guitars and that was one of the things that got stolen too wow. so the the amps i had them sitting in the studio for decades hmm. and they were just you know they kind of like just got put aside and then uh when dave came into my life um uh, dave friedman I mean, that guy is so brilliant, you know, he, he's really yeah. a great contributor to uh, the uh, um, Synergy module that I have. I'm not very good with things like dates. <laughs> you know, I'm I really, understand. <laughs> I, I, I believe that I may have had them for... Eat them and smile, which might seem odd, but the, the period before we started touring and we were just hanging out in the basement playing and rehearsing and stuff like that, that was a long time. Mm. You know, that was uh, probably a year at, at, at least. Okay. So we, uh, I, I believe I must have had one or at least one of them, but then the others came along through that time and, and for the skyscraper tour and all that, I, I had them. And like I was mentioning, finally, once I once Dave came into my life and, you know, was willing to resurrect these amps, yeah. they, just, they just sat in the corner. So there they are. And you got them. And I can't wait to hear them. <laughs> it sounds great. Do they sound to... OK? What do I they... mean, it's yeah, it's got a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun to play. Really chewy and feels yeah. Dude, feels great. So you're gonna do a uh, video on those? Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what uh, I, 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 I can't wait to see that. Thanks for watching another Amps in the Zone video on Steve Vai's Jose Monted Marshall Super Lead. I really appreciate you guys watching. Please hit subscribe if you haven't, and uh, hit the little bell beside the subscribe. That'll give you an alert every time I put out a new video. Hit the thumbs up if you dug the video. I really appreciate it. Please share it far and wide. I am Pete Thorne. I'll see you real soon for more videos.